our country and becoming the United States of America, one nation under God, indivisible. Still, we desire that to be so. And, uh, of course, Veterans Day. We celebrate the veterans, those that have served and those that have uh, retired from service that are currently also. A lot of times we'll celebrate that. But today, it really is a time of remembering uh, those. It's a memorial. If you can go back to that slide before, I was looking. I think that Memorial Day slide was looking really good. Hey, uh, I just wanted to see the flag again. You know. Is that backwards? Just kidding. But uh, I did this in first service, and I think it, it, it's good. We've already been singing some wonderful music about Jesus. My Jesus, he's really the victor. Truly, above all, in his death, in his shed blood, a great victory was won because, of course, his resurrection made all the difference. We're going to start our message, actually, in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to get a jump on me, I'm going to highlight one verse there. But for today, in our Memorial Day celebration weekend, people, um, we forget sometimes that people have given their lives uh, for this country, for the freedom that we have to sit right here in Blue Springs, Missouri on Adams Dairy Parkway. How many of you know of someone who lost their life in battle in serving our country? Would you raise your hand, please? Gosh, just as many, if not, yeah, there was so many in first service as well. You think about that right now, the, the memorial of someone who lost their lives, the memory of them today. Uh, I like to just uh, pray for a minute for, uh, but really a prayer of thanksgiving and pray for those that uh, are families that right now are agonizing over that, maybe a little extra special on this weekend. They remember uh, that someone went off to battle and they did not come home. And uh, yeah, it's real. Let's pray and give thanks to the Lord. If we could and we ought to, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, our holy God in heaven, our Father in heaven, in Jesus Christ. Thank you for making and procuring a way that we could come to you, Father, and it is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In a little bit, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. We'll commune with you in a very special way in our communion time of remembering what you have done for us, Lord Jesus Christ, as the mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, thank you for your death, shed blood, the propitiation, the payment, the necessary pure blood sacrifice. Thank you, though, that you did not stay in the grave. From up from the grave you arose on the first day of the week. And so we come together and give thanksgiving to you, holy God, that we can have this moment, this time. We've already been praising you and, and giving you thanksgiving through song and prayer and, and reading scripture and all of that already. And dear Father, I just thank you for now, uh, especially on this Memorial Day weekend, for all the men and women over the decades that have gone to war on behalf of our country to fight for the right to gather, to bear arms, and on through for our Constitution, the Republic for which we stand, one nation under God, indivisible. This celebration weekend started off of the Civil War with all the men and women, especially men, that lost their lives, but so many families that were stricken with loss. And so now to this day in 2023, there are many that have lost their lives. I pray your grace, your mercy, your love, your Holy Spirit upon them. Many of them may be lost and they need Jesus. I pray you'll bring the gospel to them and let them know there's good news, that Jesus saves, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father, but by him he has made a way. And again, I thank you for this church, for the people here that have served, continue to serve, and those that truly right now even can think of someone they've lost and maybe you could bring them an ounce of comfort, a pound of comfort, <laughs> a 
gallon of comfort of your spirit to walk them through their loss on this Memorial Day weekend that they remember someone. Again, we thank you, holy God, our Father in heaven, through the name and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I figured that we would start the series all over again. I don't know if that's... No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I just want to grab a verse out of there in light of our message today. Hashtag pass on memories. Hi, Ed. Good to see you up there. I hope I don't drive you nuts like I always do. Thank you for your patience, your long-suffering, and uh, thank you for being super sub today. I really appreciate all you do in helping us out there to make everything work. As we already sung, speaking of the victory in Jesus, all hail the King. He is the one, of course, that we celebrate. Even as we have Mother's Day and a busy May and we have celebrations of kids graduating, senior recognition last Sunday, Josh did a great job and all the young people that came up and spoke and they're all making their memories of graduation. All the kids graduated and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just a special time. We have Memorial Day weekend that shows up and there's a lot of memories that are uh, being brought up when you get together. Some of you are going to have a big picnic with your family members. Uh, some of you would love to have a picnic with family members, but uh, nobody's inviting you. Uh, so you're going to have to have your own. Get a bag of chips, go over to Quick Trip, get you a hot dog. Why do I know? I have to do this myself. Nobody wants me to come over. You know? Sometimes I'll get a salad over at Quick Trip. It's better for me, but you can tell I haven't had that many times. Usually it's a, a hot dog or a bratwurst, but this is a beautiful weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend for the good reason that it is to remember, to have memory. And we speak oftentimes of remembering the Lord, different memories. Today I want to speak to you about pass on memories. Hashtag pass on memories. To know that, hey, there is memories that have come and we center back on Jesus Christ. He is our greatest memory. He is the memorial. Again, we're going to speak of and point to and celebrate the Lord's Supper because of him and what he has done. And so it says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, a simple statement, Paul the Apostle to the church at Corinth, I'm going to highlight verse number 2 with the phrase about keeping memory, but let me read these few verses as I did a few weeks ago in our message then with the gospel and of course, first, uh, chapter number 15. Moreover, verse number 1, brethren, I've got verses 1 and 2 up there, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. It's beautiful. It was preached, it was received, and now they stand with a testimony. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the verse, a couple of verses before that said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When you confess with the mouth, you're saying, Hey, I stand on this gospel. I believe in it. It's the gospel. I stand by confessing it, and I believe on it. I've received it in my heart. There you go. Verse 2. I have it emboldened up there, up on the screen. By which also ye are saved, the gospel, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Keep in memory. Keep that phrase alive. We've spoken it a little bit. I just want to highlight that today as an introduction into our message. Verse 3, familiar here. Think of what Paul is writing here. Paul consented unto the death and the murder of all those that believed in this gospel. But he was not at the cross. He was not there, but he's giving an accounting of what happened. Because somebody gave him a memory. It got word out to him. He's speaking, of course, by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, but he's speaking from what he has heard. Somebody told him, gave an accounting. They didn't have any video. Nobody took a Snapchat there and put up a video. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I, I received. I also received this gospel message, how that Christ died for sin, our sins, according to the Scriptures, verse 4, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So now I can give you an accounting of somebody who told me, Cephas, and others that were around of his appearing, his resurrection. Verse number 6, it tells us that after that, 
he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. He's giving a, an accounting, again, by the Holy Spirit, by someone who's got a memory, an accounting of what happened. Think in real life, he's writing things down that he's been told about. Because we have no accounting that Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, before the road to Damascus. But think of his accounting here. I'm going to get into a study on the Gospel of Luke starting next Sunday. Think of the Gospel of Luke. There's two different, there's different things that are said, but I really believe truthfully that he is just a Gentile, a simple Gentile that ran into a guy named Paul. And he, of course, was speaking in the Acts of the Apostles as he writes the treatise to Old Theophilus. And he's writing some of it from, hey, this is what happened, this is what happened. Then all of a sudden you see a change around chapter number 16. And he's speaking in the first person, third person, because he's now present with Paul the Apostle. He writes the gospel. Some say, well, he was one of the 70. Where, where do you have the proof that he is one of the 70? That means it contradicts that there were Jews that were following Jesus Christ as the 12 and the 70. I really, truly sit on and settle on the fact that the Holy Spirit of God gave Luke everything to write, but he also had to get some recollection of things. How in the world did this physician put such detail into the birth of Jesus Christ? I wonder if he sat and visited with Mary. I don't know. Elizabeth. Well, the Holy Spirit told him everything. In the time that he's sitting and writing all the gospel, you wonder, was it based on the fact that some people had some memories of things that went on and they told him? But also, too, we find that he teaches on parables and things that no other gospel teaches us. We'll find out a little bit about the gospel of Luke as we get into it starting next week. Memory is very, very important. So I put up there on the screen as a question for you to start chewing on. Why is it important to keep in memory the things that are preached? If you took your Bible and just put it away, your electronic version of it all, put it away. You were not allowed to carry it anywhere and all that you could grasp is a memory of what was spoken. in live and living color in the accounting of Scripture, no one's carrying around an AV 1611 King James Bible on their laps while Paul is preaching. There is a letter that's written and they pull the letter out and read it. And they read it again and again and again. And they get together and they pray and they sing and they pray and they sing and they witness and they lead people to Jesus and they come together and they fellowship and they give a testimony and they give witness of everything that he has done and it's recorded. And you are sitting so spoiled and I am spoiled. How did they get to the place where they believed and as Paul's asking, do you keep in memory what was preached by me a few years back as I'm writing to you from Ephesus about the difficulties and issues and things that you have. Our Christian life today, just like them then, should be filled with memories of God's word that's at work in you. Some of you really love to take notes, right? But how many of you here in this room during a Bible study that uh, John, uh, uh, Dr. Cl Doc Cl I called you Dr. John. Can I call you, still call you John? Are you John Clemmer? Number three? Well, everybody else is gone, so you're just the one now. You're Doc John one. When he teaches, do you take notes? When Bobby teaches, do you try to take notes? <laughs> do you ever try to write down his stories? Or do you just go, he told that story like a month ago, and now it's different. Well, there's a f the details are always the same. I've been listening to them for years. Brian says to me the other day, I was there, and I don't know if that's the way it is. But, but it's okay. <laughs> memory. Memory. 
Real quick, raise your hand if you do not take notes wherever you are having the Bible teach. But please, raise your hand. All, come on, come on. I'm not going to, listen, you're already saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm not condemning you to anything. Because some of you have great minds. But do you keep in memory, the phrase when you look it up, only way that that phrase, when you look in the concordance with both words, says not just to recall the memorial and remembrance of what has gone on, but to speak it as word, like the living word of God. That is the meaning in that context that Paul's writing. Do you remember, do you keep it in memory? Do you keep in memory so that you can rehearse it and speak it again and say it to somebody else? The word memory simply means the faculty of mind by which it retains the knowledge of past events or ideas which are past. I love this 1828 version. It's a 200-year-old definition. If you look up 1828 and you go through, there's two other updates of the Webster, then you have the Merriam-Webster, but I love this one for this reason. Listen to what it says here. A distinction is made between memory and recollection. Memory retains past ideas without any or with little effort. Recollection implies an effort to recall ideas that are past. Memory is the purveyor of reason. How many of you would say, don't raise your hands because I want to embarrass you now. How many of you would say that you don't have a good memory? Now look at what the definition is. You may not have very good recollection. But the medical field, the sciences view, they, they can pull out memories out of you all day long. There are people that are therapists that work with people in counseling. They're able to pull out things and work them through. My hope is that they work them through and don't keep them trapped in the memory because that's important. The healing of the Word of God is most paramount. But my point in saying this is that there are memories locked into your mind. Your memory is there. That definition is real. But the recollection of things... To recollect implies an effort to recall ideas that are past. Some of you make no effort or very little effort. My mother used to drive me, oh my. Again, I mention her every once in a while. It's Mother's Day a couple weeks ago. She died in 1988. She's been gone a long time. But her voice remains. (laughs) What did you lose this time, Mark? Mark? Oh, yeah. I'm that kid of the four kids. Yep. You have to retrace your steps. Ever heard that one? Retrace my steps. Mark, go back to where you were when you lost what you lost and you forgot what you forgot and retrace your steps and you will find or remember what you were trying to remember. It works every time. For me, anyway. I I work a lot on recollection on purpose in order to memorize Scripture in order for you to recall, to have a memory, keep it in memory, you have to work with it. You have to do something with it. It actually says, again, it implies an effort to recall ideas. So, today, pass on memories. What memory comes to mind then when you recall the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, when it preached, and then how salvation came into your life? Do you remember that? I had someone one-on-one doing that in my life. His name was Mike Metzger. He would answer any question in the whole world that I would have. Some of you went to churches. You went to gospel preaching and gospel teaching churches. You'd have someone stand up and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I was taught, well, there's no possible way that can happen because you can either be saved or lost and it can change every week, every day. It's all dependent upon your works. And this is the record that God has given eternal life, and that life is in the Son. He who hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. And then, of course, 1 John 5 goes into saying that you may know that you have eternal life. Whoo! Somebody showed me that, and it began to open up the portals of understanding and believing that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man could come unto the Father but by him. That for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Do you remember hearing that, believing on that? And so your memory comes back to your mind when you go, wow, I remember that just like Paul's teaching here. Do you go back to that? Do you go to your salvation? I mentioned that two, three, four times a year during our preaching time. You should spend some time remembering what happened to you when you got saved. And if you can't remember, then make an effort to recall it. It implies that you will recollect if you truly are saved. And that's why some of you call and make an appointment with the pastor or one of our pastors on staff and say, I need to sit down and talk to you about my salvation. Because I'm not so sure I'm saved. Just like your son Michael, Bobby and John. And when he went home and talked back to you guys, it was powerful. As you had a recollection, he did not. The memory of you being saved. What does that do to you today, right now? What does that do for you on this Memorial Day? It's Memorial Day weekend. Yes, I know, but it's memory of Jesus Christ changing your life. Pass on memories today of what he has done for you. That's where we're going. Let me bring up this last piece of our introduction. The influence of iPhone technology. It's real. Some of you now, you're on the dark side, you use another type. Actually, we're the dark side, I understand. But remember, if you have an iPhone, any of you have iPhones, and you look up and you go to one of your widgets that opens up, you do things and you say, okay, they got this section in here. Oh, I forgot my code. Oh, there it is. Okay. And you go through there and you scroll through and you go, oh, memories, memories. There's memories. Well, there's a mem. <laughs> oh, goodness. All kinds of memories. It is a memory of Andrew and Christine. How are you doing up there? How did you, where was that? Where'd he go? There's memories. There's memories. And you go through there and you go, oh, I got memories. I got pictures. Well, the iPhone technology, those photos help you, right, to remember things. All of you over 50 years old, you need to just say amen. Yeah. And now I know all the other cell phone platforms, all the other software does that, and you can look up memories. You create memories. You keep memories. You hold on to them. You know what that technology does? It's training you to collect the memory and share the memory with others. You know what the iPhone technology deeply does? If you look it up, you can play a memory, create a memory, share a memory, share photos from a memory, tap a memory to play it, add a memory to favorites. You guys didn't all know how you could do all that stuff. Oh, it's so fun. Now, don't do it right now. i got about 30 minutes to go on my message. Don't, don't get distracted. Here we go. How is it that I cannot play a memory of what Jesus Christ has done? How is it that I don't create a memory of what God is doing? Share that memory. Share photos of that memory. Then tap the memory to play it. When's the last time you tapped the memory of what God has done in your life? Let me ask you, what memory of living your life in Christ alone since the Acts 1-8 conference have you shared with a family member? Just consider this. October to November, December, January, February, March, April, May. We're almost at June. Almost eight months since God spoke to you, walked you through some principles. He said, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. I want you to get some things right with me in Christ alone. Oh, I remember George Grace. He came and did a great job. Give me a specific memory on some conviction that happened on one of the preaching nights. He spoke about the Song of Solomon. He put some things before us. Why am I love sick? Am I love sick for Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the focal point of the whole book of the Song of Solomon. As he preached through that, and he had invitations every night, the next message in Christ alone, the next message in Christ alone, the next message in Christ alone. At the first of the year when I spoke all of to you about 
2023 version of the Acts 2 project I tied it into In Christ Alone. This message has the artwork of In Christ Alone. I guess it's pretty important. Maybe it'll stir a memory for you. What is that memory? Have you shared that? You know, God spoke to me at the Acts 1A conference. I'm very concerned that you have memories as believers in so many things, but not memories of what God has done in your life. Is it possible he would like to make a memory in your life and you won't let him? You want to make your memories with God, yet you won't let him make a memory in your life. There's a big difference. And there'll be a day where he'll recall everything. That's a pretty scary thought. If you're lost today, he has a memory book that's written down of a book of life. Here's your name written down in glory. Have you shared what God has done in your life from even the Acts 1 8 conference in Christ alone? We're in June, July, August, September. Hey, what's the next conference about? You can't even remember what God did in your life. You might remember the messages. My concern is, have I made the effort to recall things? A recollection of things because the memory is there. Maybe I didn't put myself in a position to receive that memory because I avoided the opportunity for God to speak to me. So I ask you, in part of finishing up our introduction and walking into just the meat of our message. What memories of life have you shared with people while praying for a chance to declare hope of Jesus Christ to them? You see, people ought to be able to hear from you and from me about God. God's life change in your life. God's new life in your life what Jesus Christ means to you. Could we possibly start doing that a little bit more together? Some of you do it. I love being around you. All you do is talk about serving the Lord, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel mission work. You're so thankful, the people you've talked to, the people that you witness to. I love that. See, it's hashtag pass on memory. Turn to Psalm 145. I want to just show you three simple Bible verses, make three little lesson points to come back to, pass on memories, and I'll be done. I'll tell you in Proverbs 10, 7, this, the memory of the just is blessed. I love that first half. It's like a lot of Proverbs are like that. Proverbs 10, 7. The memory of the just is blessed. I like that. But the name of the wicked shall rot. And one of, one of, one of those uh, solemn statements. The memory of the just is blessed? Yeah. But the name of the wicked shall rot. You see, God, he, God has memory. And his laptop computer is not overloaded. He doesn't have to go get more RAM. He's got plenty. Psalm 145 has our first little spot that I'd like to spend a minute on when it comes to a memory verse. Ha, ah, see what I did there? None of you got that. My humor's terrible. I remember that brownie. Here we go. Psalm 145, verse number seven is up on the screen. If you would indulge me, let me, let me start on verse number one and read to verse number seven. Psalm 147 is David's psalm of praise. It's the only of the 73 that he wrote that says that title. Now, did he write some praise psalms? Yes. But all of you have King James Bible. It says David's psalm. Does it say it there? David's possessive. David's, it belongs to him. David's psalm of praise. It is said to be the last one that he wrote, give or take. It was near the end of his life. You want to figure it out and track it? Go to 2 Samuel. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. 
Oh, I love the way David writes. Verse 2, every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. That's how we were singing this morning. Our victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, the victor. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. Verse 7, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of, their righteous, of thy righteousness. And it continues, the Lord is gracious. And he goes on and on. This is David's psalm of praise. It is contained in the Bible, the word of God. Do you read the Word of God? Sure, awesome. We need to do more reading because the reading of the Word of God puts us in a place where then we can tell people not about ourselves, but the memory of what God has shown us about himself. That devotion time, look at the screen what it says there. It says very simply this, pass on memories of time in the Word of God so that others... Fall in love with scripture like you before the family rejects it. See, I don't want to get in the way of my daughter or son's or grandchildren's way of finding their way to the Lord. <clears throat> Not a good answer. I can understand why you wouldn't want to push your children to a place where they would have a pharisaical, religiosity, legalistic view of God. But there are some great fundamentals in the Word of God, and so you ought to follow them. But what am I saying here? Why would you not want your children to know what you know about the Word of God? If you know some things about the Bible, why wouldn't you tell your kids? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and leadeth me by side, beside still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I heard one of my girls say this the other day. He's with you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, you don't have to fear any evil. As she was speaking to one of her children. I'm thankful for that. I'd love to hear it more. Before the family rejects God and his word, we ought to spend some time grabbing the devotional pieces, worship, communion with God from his word and passing them on. I will extol, I will magnify, I will tell of what you wrote. Everything that he wrote and here is for you and for me. Believers, why aren't your children hearing from you? Well, because pastor, you're supposed to do that. That's what we pay you for. Sure. I'll keep on going until I can't go anymore. I've got to do my part, but you have to do your part. Other preachers and other teachers, they're around. They're in. They've bought in. They're good. But you have to be bought into the Word of God, and you need to come to a place where you say, you know what? Just as David blessed the Lord, he says in verse 7 again, they shall abundantly utter the memory who? The men that speak of the might of thy terrible acts. He says, I in verse 5, then he says, they in verse 7, and he said, they'll utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Because I and then they means it implies, it's very clear that he was doing it, but others in Israel were doing it too. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. As you go there, I want you to kind of grasp a thought. Ecclesiastes 9 is a little bit to your right. I'm going to read you a little story for a minute. See if you can figure it out. I'll just read a couple pages. This is for three-year-olds, two-year-olds. Over in the Holy Land so many years ago, a merchant from Jerusalem went down to Jericho. He started out one lovely morn as dawn began to break. 
His little donkey carried all the things that he had to take. The trip was rather pleasant as they went down their way. The merchant thought of all the things that he would do that day. He had some goods to trade and sell and many things to buy. He hoped to get to Jericho before the night drew nigh. But little did the merchant know that farther down the road a band of robbers eyed with greed the little donkey's load. Alert with evil hearts, they watched and waited till at last, at, at last the unsuspecting merchant and his beasts were walking past. What story am I reading? The Good Samaritan. Is it in the Bible? Luke chapter? You get a thousand dollar gift card if you knew it. Here's the Good Samaritan, this style, for my little grandchildren. They love it. My children love them too. Someone told us about these back in the 80s. They were just singular books that tell the Bible stories in a neat little way. You did all kind of like it, didn't you? Yeah. My grandson loves the fiery furnace. Who doesn't love the fiery furnace? The angel of God that was sent to take care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Did you know that in the story that Abednego was the one that used to always have fun? At least that's in the story I read. Just a little extra, you know. Doesn't take away from the theology. But that opens up a door to talk to my grandson. He loves Jonah and the whale, the man who was swallowed by the fish. My point, the Word of God works in the lives of everyone if you would just tell them what God said. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9, a different one here where it speaks of the memory. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to read verses 4 through 10. Here we go. Ecclesiastes 9. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Of course, in this section that we talked about and preached two years ago, he's speaking of death. Listen to verse number 5. It's up on the screen. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. When you die, it's a good chance that you'll be forgotten rather quickly. Also, he's speaking that the dead can't say anything more. The dead cannot speak anymore, can they? Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. They cannot do anything under the sun anymore. Even the wicked, evil part of their life is gone too. We know Solomon is coming from a tainted side. It is under the sun, not with God. We know that when we die, there's eternity coming, one place or another. But Solomon is taking the process and the peace of the physical and you being a created being by God. Verse number 8, let thy garments be always white, let thy head lack no ointment, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life, thy vanity which is given under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou hast taken under the sun, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. What is he very simply saying is this, up on the screen. We must pass on memories of the Lord with a strong declaration of his works to the next generation. Before you are not able. When you die, you cannot tell things. I didn't, not just the word of God, I'm talking about your personal life. Your personal testimony, which is the opening of the message and the introduction. You cannot tell anybody when you're dead about what God did before you died. You didn't know I was that smart, did you? I'm just reading the scripture. Solomon has a lot of wisdom here. He's been a mess in the first eight chapters. Chapter number nine seems to be, he's starting to get in a a little awakening, but we have to wait till chapter 12 and 13 and and the conclusion of the matter, and you, you think, okay. But he's talking about under the sun. Your life under the sun. So, created being of God, new creature in Jesus Christ, which you're born again and you're brand new and you're reconciled and have a new 
new life in Christ. Before you are unable, I would ask you to consider what Solomon is saying. He's given you this beautiful life, not to live a life of sin in your flesh and being an idol worshiper of yourself. When it comes down to it, all the idols that we've ever had have always come back to me being number one. The God that I am at war at more than anything else is me. I love me, I love to worship me, I think I don't, but I usually am doing it when I think I'm not. And Solomon was in that place, and he's saying, you know, it's better. <laughs> the, the creature that was regarded as the lowest back then in those times was who? Was what? A dog. <laughs> he's saying, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. A lion was the most regal creature on the face of the earth. And when a person considers that they get to the end of their life and they're dead and they can't do anything more, it'd be better for you to be a living dog. What did Goliath said about David when he was sent against them? You send this dog against me? Come on. The dog is regard. Now, of course, dogs not anymore. I'm sorry if I'm picking on your poor little pet. I, do, I did love my chocolate lab, but she went away. But if I had a lion, man, I'd be pumped. but we do have the Lion of Judah. Before you are unable, church, consider believers this, that there is one event that's going to happen to all of us all. And there's nothing more that you can do to tell the next generation about what God has done. The first part was what God has written. The second part is about what God has done. And the third part goes to Isaiah 26. Here you go. Go to Isaiah 26. The highlight verse is up on the screen. Isaiah 26, memory. I just did a little topical thing for today. We start up the Gospel of Luke next week. Get ready. O Theophilus, the treatise. Brian, who is O Theophilus? We don't know, do we? We're going to answer that next week. Who is Theophilus? It'll take 10 seconds because we don't know. The inner workings of the Scriptures. Before we get there, I just want you to see this last piece of our lesson point today. Pass on memories. Please pass on memories of what God has written and what God has done. And lastly here, we look at this, Isaiah 26. There's a section here. Let's do 12 down to 18, 19. Watch what he says about memory here. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Very simply, here is this, this time in the word of God where the prophet Isaiah is speaking to Israel. They've been divided. They've been overtaken. The Lord has allowed them to be sold into slavery of other, other nations and other people groups. They have chosen other idols, other gods. They are worshiping other gods. And then you see this section here after they're praising God, that we can count on you, God, we can count on you, God. Now they're just praying. They're begging God to take care of things. Now, the other part of it is the prophetical piece of Isaiah and how he's speaking of Jerusalem. He's speaking of Israel. He's speaking of future Israel. And that all their enemies will be wiped out. That they won't have this difficulty. It's kind of like what happened to you when you got saved. The enemy was defeated. Yet we invite him back oftentimes. And so when we look at what prophet Isaiah is saying here in chapter number 26, verse 12, he speaks of a memory of God wiping things out, which I think is very, very important. Verse 13, O Lord our God, other lords besides thee had, ha, have had dominion over us. Israel can speak to that. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. Who? The other lords that have had dominion. And they shall not live. And they are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. That is a second coming of Jesus' coming time. Now consider spiritually speaking that when Jesus came the first time, he took care of everything for the Jews and they still rejected him. Second time, it, he's going to just take care of everything. You follow? In this prophetic statement, Isaiah is saying, 
that the people are saying in their prayer unto the Lord, you're going to destroy and make all their memory perish. The enemies, it doesn't matter anymore. When we have the fulfillment of God's kingdom to come. Verse 15, thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have, thou, have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them like a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out, please God, please God, deliver us from this. And the Lord says, hey, I get you. I get you. I'm here to do that, which you have been asking me to do, but you won't let me do it, so it's going to have to be later. Like as a woman with a child. Verse 18, we have been with child. We have been in pain. We have as it were brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. The dead shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise, wake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Oh, what it'll be like one day when Jesus reigns. You see, very simply to apply it today, to finish up our memory about how God wipes out the enemy, create memories in the gospel ministry he will get rid of all the enemies that are in the way so that you can be in the gospel ministry in Jesus Christ so other believers can embrace serving the Lord before God halts his favor. We spoke of this last year, 25 years of favor. Would you not be willing to count on the prophecy of Isaiah, the speaking of prayer and praise of the nation of Israel in their time of where they would have deliverance again? <laughs> Missing the great high priest, the Messiah, the King Jesus, when he came the first time, knowing that the second time, okay, everything is right. But we as a church and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that being aside, we look at things and go, wait a minute. So believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, I can then be in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can serve him with all fervor. What about the enemy coming after me when I want to give up the gospel to people, when I give the gospel to people? Hey, remember. Put in memory your victory that you sung about today is in Jesus Christ. And you press forward by faith and you give the gospel and you get involved in ministry. You say, Lord, I don't have the energy, I don't have the strength, but God, I know you'll supply it. You create memories in the gospel ministry and then you pass them on to other believers. When they embrace what you have gone through as your testimony, your passing on the memory. Gosh, people, listen. There's no one in here that's ever done anything for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, anything for the local church, anything for the body of Christ, anything for the gospel that changed a life, that made uh, someone a new creature, that they did in all or any of their own power. It was in the power of the Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ. You said to me the other day, I know it's nothing that I have done. And you know that, Bill. It's nothing. It's all him that's doing what he's doing. So you, you tell people, you create memories in the gospel ministry, and then you tell other believers so that they might embrace serving the Lord before God says, my favor is pulled. I'm no longer going to give you all the resources that you have. I'm no longer going to give you, by my mercy, a, a Pasadena on what you've been doing to reject what I have given you to do. I'm, you're no longer going to have the, all the resources. I'm going to take away your people. I'm going to take away your monies. I'm going to take away your talents. I'm going to take away all your gifts. We have all that we have because of God's incredible favor and his grace to do all that we have the opportunity to do collectively. You pass on the memories of what God has written. You pass on the memories of what he has done, all of, all of his incredible wonders. And you pass on what he's done in the work of the Lord in your life. As we go into the Lord's Supper, I want you to 
see just a couple pictures of the reality of things in my own life. It just represents a couple of neat things of my daughter's coaching years ago. That's Jared with my three daughters. All three of them coached a team of like six kids. That's the first time they ever coached. Of course, there's Sherman Peasley right there, the guy with the big smile. Over here, that's Christine and Kathleen coaching with Mitch Dobson. Here it's Christine with her two assistants coaching. In 2016, that's seven years ago. Boy, you got married and everything, huh? You gonna have a baby too? Here's a neat picture right here. Just all three of them serving, simple. Just passing it on. And lastly, just a picture of all three of them. Maybe some of you have seen that before. What memory of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to mind from your personal relationship with him that you will tell someone this coming week? What memory of the Lord comes to mind from your relationship with him? And in the Lord's Supper time today, what will you tell Jesus? What will you and I tell Jesus about the memory of him saving your soul? It's the Lord's Supper time. It's time to commune with him and celebrate what he has done for us. What will you tell the Lord Jesus Christ? Please stand as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper. Go ahead, Debbie, and start our music in the background. Let me pray for you, and then I'm going to have you come down and get the elements.